Are there aliens in the Bible? This week, we welcome back to the show one of my very favorite guests, the Reverend Danny Nimu, to pick over this fraught topic in a way that I think only he can. So, yes, welcome, welcome, hypnotist and psychonaut to the stars, Reverend Danny Nimu. Welcome back. How are you doing? Hello, Gordon. I'm very well. Thank you. How's it going? Yeah, really good, really good. And I, I just want to say thank you for joining me. For people who are listening, and actually for you as well, we've spoken about it over message, why we're having this discussion. So a few months ago, people started asking me what I thought about this guy, Mauro Biglino. And so I went and looked him up, and I had some initial thoughts. And then I watched an interview with him on Graham Hancock's podcast on his YouTube channel. And that was good. And then Graham's son, Luke, comes on and he asks some even, dare I say, more Rune Soup style questions. And then all of a sudden, he's quoting from a book from an author that I'm aware of, which is yourself, and it's a neuroapocalypse. And I had that Leo DiCaprio meme pointing moment where I'm like, I know that book. I know that guy. And it, it occurred to me, Luke did the right thing by tabling some of your material, some of your exploration of the Bible to get. Mauro's uh, opinion of it, because there's a fruitful exchange that happens in between what Mauro is looking at and, and what you're looking at. So funnily enough, even before Luke came on and brought up and quoted actually from your apocalypse, that I was thinking, I want to know what Danny thinks of the Mauro Biglino uh, hypothesis. And the book that we both read uh, for this is called God. Can you see that? Yes. Gods of the Bible. Uh, if you're listening to this, that was some, you know, that was some, that was some fine camera work that you just missed. All right. So that was basically the story of why I wanted to talk to you, uh, to you about this. And you have since gone on to, to read the book, which is great. So I want to, for people who are unfamiliar with Mauro Biglino, before we begin, I guess I'll give you a bio, a, a bio, cause it's actually a super fascinating story. He used to be a translator for the Vatican's official publisher. So this book, his thesis is that if you read the Hebrew of the Old Testament, literally, and at the beginning, it's, he's more clear about this in his videos than in his books. He says he's taking this as an academic exercise to treat the words in Hebrew literally and see what comes out. And what comes out is, is space aliens, frankly. But what comes out is a really powerful and eerie telling. And the reason I wanted to mention that he's actually a official translator for the Vatican official publisher is this isn't just some woolly take on the internet. He has embarked on an academic project of his own. It's obviously not Vatican approved, uh, but he's embarked on an academic project of his own of understanding or exploring what happens if we just take these words literally. And your interest and background in, in linguistics and, and what's in the Bible and in the words of the Bible, which are two different things, very often it seemed like this was the right discussion to have. So what were your thoughts of the book? You've recently read it as well. What do you think? Yeah, it's a very interesting story that the man's got. You know, he was, I think he was brought on to do a series of translations and he got quite a few volumes through it and they were published and then he went all alien. And yeah. Yeah, so he's clearly very good at his uh, Hebrew, and I'm really pleased that he's bringing light onto this fascinating book. And a lot of where he goes with it, I'm completely down with. You know, he's got a he goes into the monolatry of the Bible in quite some detail. So basically, he he looks at the idea of this omnipotent God, monotheistic God. And he says, look, this just isn't the case. And he says the same for angels. He says, like, if you look at these guys, if you look at how they behave, then they're clearly not the not the characters from Christian cosmology, if you like. And so he so he, so I, I really enjoyed investigating and exploring some of the stories that he brings to mind, like the Song of Moses, for example, where he's talking about the Council of uh, Elohim, the talk the Council of Gods and the decisions that they're going to come to. So it was good to go look back at those things. Um, about the literalism, so there's this line which he quotes on towards the beginning of his book where he's, I speak clearly and not in riddles, is what Yahweh says. And 
I don't know if that's a provocation from the god. Mm. You know, look at me, I speak clearly and not in riddles. Is it a riddle? Reminds me. That would be very him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because, you know, ever since that book was first produced, well, no, ever since that book was compiled, and I don't mean Mauro Biglino's book, I mean the Bible, people have been uh, arguing uh, and warring over what it means, you know. So clearly it doesn't have a plain meaning. And I guess his thesis is if you look at it concretely, and you translate, you work out what it actually means, then, yeah, space aliens. And I don't think I go all the way with him. In fact, I disagree in a couple of ways about the nature of language itself and about yeah. the nature of Hebrew in particular. Yeah, that's the, this is why I knew you would be the right person for it. But I wanted to just record scratch on the space aliens part because we're, as we were bouncing backwards and forwards on how to run this episode, I said, well, I'll do the space alien stuff because I kind of wrote a book about my irritations with the ancient aliens hypothesis, which is, of course, starships. And what I noticed immediately from before reading Mauro's book, when I started watching his videos, and I don't mean this negatively, and we'll come to that, and it, it leads right into the language. But this is a, a Zechariah Sitchin reboot. And whether that's intentional or not, I mean, it, I doubt it. But Zechariah Sitchin was really big in the 70s with the idea that if you took the Sumerian stories literally, you would get space aliens. But you would, And the thing is, when people tried to discredit him, they said, oh, he's not a good translator, but he actually was. That wasn't his problem. It's the same with Maurer. Like, Zechariah Sitchin could read and translate Akkadian at a professor level. Like, that wasn't his problem. And you can actually find video on YouTube of him going line by line with a professor going, is that a reasonable reading? Is that a reasonable reading? That's not what happened. It's when he read it literally with his own cosmology, he developed this idea of the planet of Nibiru and the Anunnaki live on that. And they created mankind to mine gold to save the atmosphere of um, their dying planet. And that tells us more, I th well, it tells more about Sitchin as a man and his cosmology and his personal proclivity. But I think it tells us more about how language works and how you need a metaphysics of language itself <laughs> before, before you try to understand what words in a particular language mean. And I, that's why I think where I think you were getting. But for people who are unfamiliar with Sitchin, what I did for Danny, and I'll just include in the show notes, I spent all of 90 seconds using some AI to put together an overview of Zechariah Sitchin's life and work, because the ancient aliens thing is fraught because some of it's kind of true in its own way, but it is also fraught because it's dangerous and all of a sudden you can turn a corner and end up really racist. So it's, uh, it's this odd, dangerous category of fundamentally understanding that the official version or the official version of history and our understanding of these texts is wrong. The ergo space aliens is also probably wrong. Uh, but it's it's quite important culturally to get a view of, of how big Sitchin was and, and where this idea came from. Years ago, I had Peter Lavender on the show to talk about the origins of this ancient alien idea. And you can make a case that it's the 19th century. You can make a case with the theosophists and Basum and early 20th century with Lovecraft. But this is all fiction and esoterics. It becomes a proper thing with Velikovsky and Sitchin in particular. So it's very much a 20th century even post-nuclear space race materialist thing. And it shot through with that, which isn't to say there isn't stuff there to learn. But I just wanted to, before we move into the language, go, this has been done before. And it's been done before in a way that is useful if you know what you're reading. And, I, and that's pretty much the opinion I had landed on for the Biglino material, is this is quite useful and interesting if you know what it is you're reading. What do you think to that? Is that a reasonable way of describing it? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, I reckon. I think it's really important we frame this discussion a little bit uh, by seeing as we're going to be talking about language. Here we are, obviously, using language to talk about language and also using language predictive AI to inform our language discussion about language. So we're deeply embedded in, in words here. And so I particularly want to kind of highlight one thing before we get going 
is that I did a, a, a talk uh, a long time ago at Breaking Convention. It's called Prejudice and Neocolonialism in the Academic Study of Ayahuasca. And it kind of moves towards that area of where the academy gets racist. And so I just want to be really clear about when we're talking about worldviews that emerge out of the 19th century and have are embedded into an anthropology which has as its field of study how the white race is the perfection of a series of, of an evolution of races basically we're in the area where people are talking about race and thinking about race in a certain way and also thinking about european enlightenment philosophy in a certain type of way right now saying that a certain idea emerges from a context which has elements of racism you know, and we could say the same about Crowley's work, for example, and yeah. I'm a big fan of him, you know, and he himself was really clear that he, you know, he said some very interesting things about race. He was talking about race. But when he talks about the Hindus, for example, he's saying he says we can either keep these guys subjugated or we can respect them for the incredible feats that they do and they've done. And so it's very difficult, different thing to say that somebody is racism than to say that they're some of what is in their analysis has links to a society which is which looks at race in a certain type of way right so i just kind of want to put that out there right at the beginning that's fundamental like when it comes to language because i'll just add a piece to that there is a the thing that i struggle with the academic history of magic even for the people who are good natured about it is the assumption that Indigenous groups or other language groups, in this case Hebrew, are describing science poorly, right? And so it falls to us who are better at science to, to correct or improve it. That happens when we talk about ethnobotany, right? Where we talk about Indigenous groups being almost scientists because, oh, it turns out this part is actually useful. It's this, there's a even in the hands of people who will swear, and probably rightly so, that they aren't racist. Like, that we're in dangerous territory. We're operating with dangerous epistemology, well, powerful epistemologies that in the wrong hands, <laughs> like a handgun, can make a mess. Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of embedded there in the language. I remember being out to dinner with a... I used to actually run a charity, an interfaith charity. And I was out to dinner with one of the guys who represented the British Hindu. And I used the word Dravidian without thinking. And he kind of... We were out in your restaurant. He looked across the table and said, at least allow us to use our own racist terms, please. And yeah, so it's very much embedded in just the very way that we speak as well. So, yeah, I mean, you bring up an interesting point there because the Greek language... And the Indo-European languages generally define things in a very different way to how, for example, Hebrew does, for example, how Japanese does. And I think I want to talk to that a little bit because Aristotle's laws of thought emerged very clearly out of the way that Greek language works, right? It's Aristotle's laws of thought. And this is kind of where we get what becomes the analytical tradition and what becomes the scientific tradition it again emerges out of that greek context where nature is something separate to the individual i'm simplifying a whole lot here but one of the things that aristotle so aristotle's three laws of thought are a thing is a thing a thing like the law of non-contradiction non which is a thing is it can't be a thing and another thing at the same time, and the thing, yeah. of, uh, the law of the excluded middle. So it's either that or it's this, right? And that kind of makes sense, you know. Is it a teapot or is it a teacup? You know, makes sense. It was so. This gives rise to a certain way of looking at things and dividing up the world. Even in the time of, even in the Greek times, there was what's his name, you. Eubulides, I believe that's how you pronounce his name. He was the guy who asked, at what point, though, as you drop grains of sand, <clears throat> at what point does the grains of sand, do the grains of sand become a heap? You know. So he pointed to this this problem with the language, with the Greek language, that it doesn't have an intermediate, it, it it doesn't have an intermediary state, and neither do ours. When we start to define a thing, we define it as this or that, and that's kind of the way. We build up categories in our mind in that sense. Now, that isn't the case in Hebrew. In Hebrew, something can mean 
to the, the there's much fewer words in in Hebrew. You know, you can read the Bible without a very large vocabulary because the same word can mean a whole stack of different things. So, for example, Biglino is looking at the word ruach um, a lot, which, you know, it comes from the word wind. But ruach can mean a whole load of different things. And it kind of, he basically says it's a spaceship, if I'm reading him yeah. rightly. Yeah, the flying machine. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that word can, it derives from, yeah, I mean, we won't jump in too far with it, but it's something that moves around in the air, you know. There's a line right at the beginning of the Bible. Let's find it here. I think it's Genesis 2, 7, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm just getting on Blue Letter Bible. By the way, if anyone is interested in kind of understanding the roots of words in Hebrew, I can't recommend anything better than the Blue Letter Bible org, which is where you will get a an interlinear translation and you can go and kind of click on each word and look at how it's used in other time other places in the bible it's interesting because we're about to talk about alan barfield later on and that was one of the examples for him in hebrew as well the word ruach but it's i don't want to like be kind to the big lino like hypothesis particularly in the videos he says listen you know <laughs> i know languages don't have to be taken literally. I'm aware I haven't like cracked the code, <laughs> right? After 4,000, 3,000 years in the case of Hebrew, like I haven't cracked the code. I'm saying this is what it says when you read it literally. And stuff emerges and stuff is concealed when you do that. And Ruach is a really good example because some of the, having said that, having just said a nice thing about him, I will say some of it is a bit cynical as in, and like, well, you have you found it? Because otherwise, I've got a really cool thing that, like, an aside <clears throat> made about the cherub guarding the entrance back into, <clears throat> and essentially that somehow needs, like, has a one entrance garden that he needs guarded. And you're like, this is, yeah. that's not. Yeah. Do you actually think that's what they meant? Do you literally well, it, it, think that the creator, like, and that's where you go, okay, I'm going to meet you halfway and I'm listening to you, Mauro, but then you'll do cynical things like that. And you go, that, <clears throat> If you take it literally and you get a nonsense answer, it's not that the Bible is stupid. It's that you can't take this literally, <laughs> right? I like, think what he's doing in one sense there is he is, he's challenging over and over again in his book this idea of the omnipotent God. And you know, once, you've, once you've moved away from that, then you don't need to continually challenging it. You need to continue, continue challenge it. But I think in the ecology of perspectives on the world, a big Lino is, is really, really interesting because he's presenting these ideas saying, hey, what does this mean? And then the answer is, hmm, well, what does it mean? So the line I was looking for is Genesis 3, 8. In the King James Version, it says, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of day. And that line, so the word there, cool, is ruach as well, yeah, walking in the cool of day. And um, that's not to say that um, it necessarily means cool, but it certainly doesn't mean, well, it doesn't sound like it means spaceship there. They, ho they heard the voice, they heard the sound of Yahweh Elohim moving in the garden, in the ruach, in the spirit, or in the mind. There's another thing that ruach means is mind. But you, you can translate that line as, there's lots of words in there, right? So the word for heard is Shema, as in Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim. That's, a, that's one of the, hero Israel, the Lord is our God. It's one of the main Jewish prayers. And so that way it's normally translated as hear, but Shema doesn't, sometimes it means to understand, as in to perceive between good and evil, for example. There's lines where it clearly doesn't mean hearing a sound, but it's more about perception. And well, that's a really interesting line to go down, actually, the word Shema. But we'll, we'll leave that for a minute. And they, so, and they perceived the voice or the sound of Yahweh Elohim moving in the garden. In the cool of day can also be translated in their minds on that day, as in in their minds yeah. as they understood that thing on that day. And this is just immediately after they've, it's literally the line after, so Genesis 3.7 is after they've eaten the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and their eyes are opened and they knew that they were naked so they've discovered something they've recovered they've covered themselves up and then off they go and they immediately they start to perceive something a little bit differently 
right? And that's the word ruach as well, mm-hmm. mind. And I guess another thing to, um, to, to think about regarding this text is how the same word is used in the same way as any poetry. You'll use the same word in different parts of a poem to give different angles on an idea and to kind of expand out on what something means. So I'll give another example, which is just from the end of that chapter. Oh, no, the end of that chapter is one where you get your the flaming sword. So the, the end of the chapter before, which is Genesis 2 has this line, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. And that word there, right, the word naked, is spelt exactly the same as the word in the following line, the beginning of Genesis 3, and that says, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, and the word there, the word there is subtle. So the same, because Hebrew doesn't have vowels, or it has one vowel, and, it, and the way that you pronounce a word is according to either according to tradition or according to uh, before the tradition was set. And we're talking about the eighth century here, AD. Before that tradition was set, there were lots of different ways of translating, of pronouncing different words in the Bible, and they give rise to different meanings. And because of that, some of the Eastern churches, for example, they have a different translation to the Bible that we have in the King James because they're working from a tradition of pronunciation which is different to the one that the that the Western churches take it from because it was set very late that kind of uh, that translation and it was and that, that pronunciation and it was also set to, with a very specific politic in mind or a very specific approach which is that you shouldn't offend you shouldn't offend the holy one really but before so just coming back to this word subtle and naked so in the first sense it's pronounced in the masoretic bible yeah and if you think about what how we read that and they were and they were both naked and they were a man and his wife and were not ashamed we think of that in terms of the innocence of these two yeah because it's it's, and it's also it's before they had the fruit and then the very next line in fact if you look at it on a scroll it's not just the very next line it's the exact word underneath it right which is also spelt the same way it's a plural rather than a single but it's sorry the, the first one is plural and the second one is singular so it's got a slightly different ending but the root of it is the same or the beginning part of the word is the same and that is normally pronounced arom sorry arum is the second one and the serpent was more subtle and arum means subtle and arom means naked and the subtlety is used there to describe the sneakiness of the snake and it's the only adjective which the snake gets in the entire bible and we've built a an entire kind of interpretive tradition of who's the good guy and who's the bad guy out of, in the garden in that story and I think we're going to get on to the Sumerian story and how that relates to who the serpent is in the Bible but you know, the Christian tradition which has uh, has laid down so much of our, our culture including the fact that you know women were mistrusted as the people who are open to temptation since the very literally the beginning of the human story <clears throat> and we still have yeah we still have sexism which yeah. is the rollout of that today you know that comes from a very specific way of choosing to pronounce a word which can mean either naked or it can mean subtle and also it can mean prudent as well yeah i think just this is one of the reasons to read the book so i found it interesting i depart for i don't not that Mao is officially saying that you should read it literally but one of the strengths of the book I found is its unveiling of how arbitrary the serpent, original sin, and all these cornerstones <laughs> actually are when you look at the text and you go, well, this is just simply not in there. It, it, it's, quite, it's quite good. And for when it comes to Satan and Lucifer, I think that was the uh, best dismantling of, of that stuff I've read since Peter Gray's book on the actual topic. So there's some really competent... For people who are thinking, well, I'm not really interested in space aliens and literal reads of the Bible, like a literal read of the Bible will unveil some gems and this, <laughs> right? Which is, no, oh, this, none of this shit is in here. And I think that was kind of cool. Anyway, just to interrupt, that there's, there was, he has a few king hits that outside of the space aliens. And I think that's some of them. Yeah. And it's lovely that it's coming from a man who was so embedded in the Vatican as well. Yeah, you know, there's. I'd love to know what his moment was when he's busy translating the Bible, and he was like, "Oh," because there is a quite often a there is a moment when people who are into the Bible and often kind of and often Christians, obviously, who go, "Man, these patriarchs are behaving like assholes," 
or yes. this Yakuela heme. Like, who's the guy who's lying in the hmm? Wait, who tells us who tells the lie and who tells the truth? And oh wow, and it can be kind of mind blowing. A, a lot of time, people go in the direction of narcissism with that, and sometimes they go in the direction of of, of space aliens or with cynical atheism, and they're all yeah. there are other roads. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And what road should we take, Gordon? All right. Well, now I interrupted there, but I think we are heading into something that was quite good about this, the metaphysics of Hebrew. What really struck me in its absence here, because I don't know that much about it, but we were talking about Owen Barfield, so we'll, we'll get onto him in a minute. What really struck me here is that, so a definition of psychedelic is, uh, I don't want to say mind expanding so much as I want to say, opening up new perspectives. There's an expansiveness to it. And in the absence of psychedelics, there are languages that are designed to do that, right? So when you look at those lines you're talking about in the Bible, where Ruach is a really good example, uh, hearing the Lord, that, that can be in the mind, that can also be becoming aware of the sound of the wind moving through the trees of the garden as being a sacred sound. And the the trick of a language that's, let's just say, psychedelic is not that you have to find, it's not a quiz. You don't have to find the one correct one, right? You're not supposed to go, ah, so it actually means that. It's supposed to mean all of these things at once, and it's supposed to mean the one that you need to encounter when you read the text at that point in time. This is why Hebrew is like the uh, like ultimate example of a language that people read continuously <laughs> and get different stuff out of it because it responds psychedelically. It's not designed to be literal. Now, the plot twist for me and Mauro Biglino there is one of the things it can offer up because it is a multidimensional language is a literal read that will give you a space alien story. Like that's, it's not, that's not in there. That's in there, right? But it's not the only thing that's in there. And that's the, the, the thing, the discussion I want to have, because I think languages that can do that are more accurate in describing reality than the ones that we typically use today, at least in the way we use them. I'm not necessarily as down on English as, as a lot of people are, particularly if you go back a few centuries and you see what it can kind of do in good hands. But it's certainly no Hebrew. <laughs> and it, But it's different eras, right? And that's kind of where I think I wanted to table more than one narrative because i do want to talk about the space alien stuff and i do want to talk about what you think the word elohim means and all that kind of stuff but i did just want to go it, it hebrew strikes me as being very psychedelic if that makes sense in the traditional definition of it yeah yeah exactly so uh, it reminds me of this rudyard kipling quote the words are the most powerful drug used by mankind and as a hypnotist, you know, just before we got online, I had a, I, uh, had a hypnotherapy client and we were just talking away. I, I didn't even drop her into an obvious trance. And the visual imagery that was coming out of her was, you know, there was whirlwinds and there was stuff moving around and there was a tree that she grabbed onto and then she kind of goes down to the roots of the tree. You know, I'm just talking to her over, over Zoom. And, you know, if you... Like, so words can be extremely psychedelic, even if they aren't Hebrew, you know, and if, if I've done kind of street hypnosis where I'll get to I'll have someone to look into a bottle and see the acid world. And you can do things like you can give someone a mega command and then say something along the lines of, you know, every time you sip a drink of your, uh, a sip of your water, you'll get twice as drunk as you are at the moment, twice as drunk as you are at the moment, twice as drunk as you are at the moment. And once you kind of hook yourself into somebody's mind, or rather, that's not the way of putting it, once somebody goes along with you on the along with the story that you're going yeah you can do all kinds of things with um with words and this is why words are so powerful and this is why they contain that magic i guess the thing about the about hebrew is because a very slight modulation of your airwaves can change the way that can change the meaning of a word then it has this kind of extra extra power really and yeah, if you imagine the way that it was, so we tend to read, you know, we read a book to ourselves in our head these days, and that's what we do it. I, I think it was, who wrote it? Confessions, it was Aquinas, who said that when he first saw, I mean, this is a guy who saw all kinds of upheavals and all kinds of horrors during his life, lived through very tumultuous times. 
But in when he's kind of reflecting over his life, so some of the really kind of freaky stuff that he saw, one of the really freaky things that he saw was somebody reading without speaking the words aloud because you didn't do that back in the day, yeah. you know. So it, words were performative and scrolls were to be read to a crowd a little bit the same way that you might think of a Greek philosopher in the square kind of reading out his discourse. So the way that the good book <coughs> was used, a little bit like how you have it in churches these days, you know, you read a bit of the gospel on a particular day and it relates into the cycle. Oh, it's this part of Easter. Okay, we're going to read that story now. And there's a cycle which is in the, the way that Jews read their, read their scriptures every morning when they read them publicly. There's a cycle which has gone through. And you can imagine, in the same way that sermons today, you know, the, the sermon bounces off current affairs and also stuff in the text, and it puts them uh, into conversation, yeah? Well, you can do that with the very way that you pronounce words in the Bible. You could do. Until, um, as I said, there's the Masoretes that come along and they say, right, this is how you're meant to pronounce the Bible. And other ways, you're not meant to pronounce the Bible like that because that's wrong. And they invent a whole system of... Um, of, uh, of vowels which don't, don't even exist um, in the time when the when the Bible was written. And in fact, if you go far enough back, the Bible isn't even written with spaces, it seems. So the word yeah. is like one long continuous line of code, you know. It was like that. That's I remember learning that, I think, first from Donna Haraway, but you, you'd go into a monastic library and you're encountering, it was cardio, right? Because you're standing up all day reading and uh, by candlelight and you're, the words are coming out of like the gloom because it, it's all one line. And so you don't actually know what's going to happen. And this is where you have to read with a little stick and say the words out loud and actually speak them into the cosmos. So this is like language is a language is psychedelic, right? And it's funny, Hebrew, it, it's not like someone sat down and decided to invent a language that didn't have vowels necessarily, but it's not a accidental omission, right? Like it's deliberately constructed so that it improves that polyvalent multivalent capacity to have three little letters that can mean seven things, depending on how, you, <laughs> how you're coming at it yeah. and what's around it. Like that's what it's supposed to do. That's the key, I think, to understanding not why Mauro is wrong, because he never said Hebrew can't do that, but don't think that the, that Hebrew or the Old Testament is something that you unlock like a code and there's one real answer behind it. It's not how it's built, right? Yeah, I like the fact that you brought up that little stick because that they read along with, because in the Jewish traditions, and if you go to synagogue, you'll see a, a gold kind of pointy stick, which is used to read that text. And it's called a yad. Uh, a yad means a hand and also to point. And it also means a place, as in, out of all these different places it could be, it's there, right? And the word Yod is the same letters. And the, and or, and that is the name of the letter, which is the Y, or the Yod. Yod Hey Vav Hey is the, the name, the tetragrammaton, the name of the name of God when he appears in this world. So you have Elohim, which from Mara's perspective is this council of gods, and there's definitely something in that. There's all, but one of the things about the Elohim is that they don't really come into this world. They don't partake as the word Elohim. It doesn't really partake into this word. Whereas when Yahweh comes into this world, it's with these names that often begin with the letter Yod. Yahweh, Yah, for example, Yahweh Yireh, Yahweh Rafa, all these different, all these different words. And and the Yah, you often find it inserted as a letter into other words. So an example of that would be the word Dabar. And the bar means thing, and it means word, and it means discourse, and it means paragraph, and it means a whole load of things. And there's a whole, there's, it's an absolutely fascinating word because it asks the question of, like, is the thing in your head or is the thing this collection of bits of paper from my book? Is this collection the bits of paper here, you know? <clears throat> is that a page or is it a book or how, you know, the, the fact that we decide that this is, um, that anything really is a thing is a process that goes on in our head but when you put the yod into the word the de, de, de bard you get the word the beer and the beer is the name of the chamber in which it's the chamber in the back of the tabernacle which is considered the dwelling place of place of yahweh and it's also a hot box where all kinds of fumigants were burned all kinds of incenses with psychoactive capacities were burned and it's where the high priest would go to go and talk to talk to his God, talk to Yahweh, 
with words, and then you come out of the debir, which is basically, you know, the word word with an extra yod in it. And that yod is where God comes into this world. Yeah. Very and good. so it's actually and then he the word, would, like, let me be clear about this, right? So you have the word debar, which means word and thing, and you put a yod in it, as in God coming down. And you have the name of the place where God comes down <laughs> into an area to communicate. And then presumably, once the priest leaves, he has like the Dabar, like he has a word, right? So the, yeah. it's literally, it's an animation, little, <laughs> amongst other things. Like yeah, it's yeah. actually putting God in the word or body. Like that's powerful, right? Yeah. And now he comes. So he comes out of the out of that chamber, and he makes a pronouncement to his congregation. You know what we're going to do next. So often he'll go in there, and it might be war divination because that was, was you know often it was divination. Or where are we going to find water? You know they're traveling around in the wilderness. And by the way, wilderness is midbar in Hebrew, which is mem and then debar. Mem being the womb, so yeah. midbar, which means wilderness, also means mouth, as in the womb of the word, where words come from. And then when God comes into the word debar, you get this thing. But I want to say one more thing about, about yod, just as a letter and as the phonics of it. It's a semi-vowel. So you've got two semi-vowels in Hebrew. You've got the y sound and you've got the w sound. They're both found in the name of Yahweh. And you've then got the vowel, which is aleph. Yeah, so Aleph is the first letter of the word Elohim, and Aleph can be pronounced A, E, E, U, like that, lots of different ways. It doesn't have a natural ending. Yeah, so the sound, you know, I could scream until I run out, I run out of breath. Ah, you can't do that with a Y or a W. Y is where the yeah, breath okay. doesn't stop. But it comes into the world with a y, and then you've got the consonants which come into the world with a full stop, yeah, like b or k or ch or something like that. So when we're talking about breaking up the world, which was kind of the point I wanted to get back to, we're reading the text and we're working out where to break up the world. Where we break up words, you don't break it up at the r, you break it up with the b, yeah, uh, abba. Abba means father, and you know, the Bible begins with b. It does, and there's a whole conversation amongst the rabbis. Why didn't you begin with the first, you know? Aleph goes to God and he says, I'm the first of the letters. Why didn't you begin the Bible with me? And he says, no, 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 I begin it with B. And the, the rabbis come to a conclusion that you're not allowed to, you know, of all the things you can investigate in Hebrew or in the Jew Jewish tradition, you can't investigate what comes before, what goes after, what the very small and the very large, right? Don't look into infinity. And before the B, yeah, which is like normally the first phoneme that a baby, it's called a baby for a reason. The babbling of a baby is the B. You know, it's called Abba for a reason, is where things begin with B. And also in like, you know, Brahma as well, you get the same kind of phonics, the same lettering. So I, I just want to say that kind of, it's not quite onomatopoeia, but the language of Hebrew is so extraordinary in how it uses the phonemes and how it discusses all of that kind of stuff, that looking at it and saying, what does this mean? It means this. Therefore, you know, you can, if you get if you get literal with it, you're missing, I think, yeah. with respect to Big Lino, so much of the story, and it yeah. seems a shame. Yeah, exactly, and that's where because we were talking about Owen Barfield, what it immediately reminded me of is <clears throat> his realization, and it was Gary Luckman who introduced me to the inkling Owen Barfield, and he was. As a kid, well, a kid, when he was at Oxford, 18 or 19, he was translating, and I think it was Cicero, or no, it was the death of Cicero. And Cicero passed out of life, is what it said in Latin. And he realized that's not only better than Cicero died, it's like, it's more accurate. <laughs> it's actually better. And so he reversed this, like, the UG theory of language where... One day I hit my head on the cave, and then the next day before I wake up, my wife says, Ugh, and I don't hit my head on the cave. Because what he looked at with language was that it started at a level of sophistication and declined. And we see that with Hebrew. And he looked at Hebrew. That was one of his examples, you know, of a language that can demonstrate this idea of inner history. Like this Hebrew has the same word, ruach, we just spoke about, for inner and outer phenomena simultaneously. And he, he, Got correctly from this, I would say, that we used to mind the world differently. We used to like inhabit the world without the same inner outer divide. And it reminds me, it's just at Matafero's land in New Zealand last week. And Maori, like Reo, is, is like that. So indigenous words are still 
where is it still like that? You can get glimpses of what that Barfieldian understanding of language is like, where the word describes an outward and an inner thing at the same time. And even saying that in English is kind of annoying <laughs> because I've, I've already had to, to break them up. But this is when the key to understanding, oh, is there a literal translation of the Bible, isn't anything to do with the languages that are in these books. It's what has happened to the history of language since we initially had these books. Because that's the key. Like, we've been through a bunch of questionable philosophical projects over the last few centuries that have really done a number on language. And Barfield could see that. Like, we're literally worse at it than we were. And that's an invitation back into understanding, I would say, the magic of what it is we're like talking about and thinking about, right? So Barfield had this idea of original participation. So humans experience the cosmos in a more unified and less abstract way, which is weird because we think of abstract as being similar to lyrical, but it's not. A, a unified experience of the cosmos is far more lyrical, is far more beautiful. When you're in that state, you say someone passed out of life. You don't say they died. And that's, for me, I've got a plot twist with Mauro when we get to the end, but that for me is the is my way, not speaking Hebrew, is my way into understanding the magic of languages like this. Yeah, it's so interesting. As you were speaking, you actually broke up a bit on Zoom. And this, <laughs> like we're getting it really now. So where we break up a story has become even more you know we're starting to see how annoying it can be on on zoom and then you can interject all kinds of your own thing into the space and i wonder if something similar has happened in the kind of in between those two different ways of of engaging word you know when we start to start to break up you call to mind something with barfield quote um which is it was genesis 5 and it's describing a series of geezers growing old and dying and it says and all the days of mahala heel uh were well, eight hundred and ninety and five years, and he died, and and then Jared, um, and he begat sons and daughters, and he died, and then it says, and Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah, and Enoch went with God after he begat Methuselah in three hundred years, and begat sons and daughters, uh, and all the days of Enoch were however long they were, and Enoch went with God, and he was not, for God took him. So you've actually got both there. You've got the he lived and then he died, but then Enoch was special and he didn't because he was taken, you know, and Big Lino come, comes to this and he says, well, he was taken because he got taken up in a spaceship and off he went. There are, and, and you know, I'm grateful to him for kind of directing my my attention. He wouldn't be the first to, to think that about Enoch. Enoch is the most space alien, I would say, of the stories in the Old Testament, right? There's, I suppose there's Ezekiel's vision. But we should do that. We should do some space aliens, though, because one of the things that didn't, which is surprising, I guess, for me, didn't occur to me until I read this book, was the origin of the word Yahweh. Because we've just spoken about its magical construction, so we say in Hebrew. But Mauro points out that the word appears to come into Hebrew from other cultures where inevitably Yahweh has a wife or a consort, which also happens, <laughs> which people, is in this book, bless him, it's plainly evident that God was not a bachelor in old kingdom times, right? Uh, but that was super interesting to find that the term, like this is a God that predates, uh, let's say this right, historical evidence for Hebrews as a, as a cohesive culture. So th this God is actually kind of old. What do you, I mean, have you ever looked at the origin of the word Yahweh? Like where, where did we get the name of God from? Do you know what I mean? Is that something? Cause I found that really archeologically fascinating. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's considered a modification of the verb to be from a kind of Hebrew perspective. And it was evening. Yahi means it, you know, it, it is, it was Yahweh. Yeah. You can find, you find Yahweh changing quite a lot in the in the archaeology, as you mentioned, options to Yahweh and his Ashira, for example, his wife. I I think, for me anyway, the really interesting way of looking at what the gods, where their names come from, is how they relate to the development of language in a child and the feeling of words. So coming back to, for example, I mentioned B before. B, it's a plosive, you have to stop you have to stop the breath and it's normally 
you know, half of babies, the first phoneme that they manage is buh. And they babble, buh, 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 buh. they start doing buh, 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 buh. You also get babies going, oh, wah, 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 which is an easier sound to, it's an easier modulation of the, what a baby starts saying, which is, ah, and when it's at the breast, mm, that's a sound where the the breath can continue. Mm, and mother in Hebrew is ima, which is what you would say if you were breastfeeding. Um, 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 uh. And then burr comes along, abba. Okay, here comes daddy and burr, for example. It means a ditch, means a gap in the ground, or it means brandishing a sword, abba, that, that root, or it means like maize shooting up. I've, and the god, the Canaanite god, and Babylonian, Baba, Babylonian god, Baal, you know. So you get, you, you move from a ba to a ya. And I, 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 and yes, there are other Semitic storm gods who have, who have a name which is closer to Yahweh, which seems to be Yahweh, seems to emerge in the progression of religions. But I think it also bears thinking about what it means to be a god whose name doesn't mean like Baal means Lord, for example. So when we translate, when Yahweh is translated in the Bible, it's Lord. But when that seems more like a term of address, you know, or an honorific, than when Moses asks him, he's, you know, he says, go, go down to Egypt and release my people. And Moses says, which is the stutter. He says, I'm a man with uncircumcised lips, right? Uh, he's, he's talking about how he's, he's got a stutter. And even in the poetry of the, the verse, it goes, gunga, 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 gunga. and, and uh, I think it's gunga, or gaga, um, is, is a stutter in Hebrew, you know? So he says, I, I'm, so he's a guy who doesn't have much of a quality of speaking, a power of speaking. And, and Yahweh says, go, I'll be in your mouth. And this is what you, you, you are, uh, my name is, I am, my name is I am that I am, um, but you can call me I am to your, you know, introduce me as I am. So I'm not answering your question too directly. Yeah, there's a god of the area who is something to do with Storm, and he's hitched up with Ashira. And there's something I think which is really interesting, that Ashira has the ah and the sh, both of which are considered mother letters in Hebrew, along with m, which I already mentioned, ah, m, and sh are all mother letters and sh is the one or s is the one at the end of the at the end of the alphabet it's the last t t is the last letter s is the second last letter and it's interesting <coughs> the r word last and best and all the superlatives end in st because it's kind of as the as the as the as the word comes to the end so it's y w and ash come together in some really interesting way and and kind of, yeah, what does that mean? And there is actually something else about the storm gods from which Yahweh seems to be derived. It goes again back to this idea of, of, of Ruach because the word Ruach derives from the root word is, is something heavy. It's, it seems to be when something assumes form, yeah? Let me see if I've got that right, actually. One second. No, sorry, I'm talking about kavod. Kavod is the glory of God. It's how he appears in this world. Well, it's always translated as glory, but it seems it's like a cloud. It's desc it describes a cloud. It's in the incense. It's when he appears. And if you think about what storm clouds do, is that they condense into rain, which then precipitates, and it comes out of the potential. And in Hebrew, actually, mayim is water, and shamayim is the heavens. Yeah, so it's the water which is which we can look at. It's the water which hasn't pot become potential yet. Yeah, and then kavod is this word which is when a cloud is formed, but it has this meaning or the root of it, uh, which is kaved, is to be to harden for something to harden, something to become heavy, something to become abundant. So we see that when, for example, Yahweh hardens Pharaoh's heart when he wants to let the uh, Israelites go. He says no, and he hardens his heart. Or someone falls over, he breaks his neck because he was heavy. You always think about heaviness and kind of coming back to this idea of you know coming towards the idea of space aliens. When Yahweh comes into this world, something hardens, and it gives me like the impression of ectoplasm almost. You know, this kind of spiritual. Okay, yeah material which comes it's now whoa i'm here you know <clears throat> yeah see a couple of things in this book didn't occur to me and i did a, a cursory chat gpt search on it one of the points maura says is that the hebrews or the israelites could have descended from 
the Sumerians, which never occurred to me before, but a bunch of other people did. And it, the, there's no reason why they wouldn't, literally genetically speaking, just because there's sort of people in the area, right? But that, I think, is powerfully important because he's, he's making some claims that plenty of other people have made, including, you know, British Museum professors and so on, like Irving Finkel, who I met at his book launch to talk exactly about this, that a lot of the, the mythic or mythological jewels of Judaism originate, or at least we pick them up in history, in Summa floods, et cetera, et cetera, right? Even to the point, which I hadn't I, thought of before, literally ever, that the serpent in the garden is Enki to Yahweh's Enlil. And that that kind of fundamentally changes it. And the reason I think this is why I want to talk about this now and bring it into space aliens is if that is so, and even if it isn't, I've always, for the last 15 years, understood and experienced the Elohim as as a survival into a language or religion that is accessible to me of a much older uh, polytheistic, I guess, cosmology of not necessarily gods, right? And I, I think, again, because we, when we think of gods and polytheism, we're not just in, in our materialist age, but we, we even have to get through classical and ancient Greece <laughs> to get to here, right, where they... Decide, that was the first time I said, well, we're going to match everything up and everything looks like Venus is over here and whatever and everything in its place, to your Aristotle point. So for me, the Elohim as space aliens isn't too far off, right? Because I think it's beings. And it's funny how you mentioned before, like, they're not really in the story, except they kind of are because they send their progeny down to bang the women, right? So we actually, it's, you can understand, and just bringing back to Zechariah Sitchin, he had some unusual, very wealthy contacts, so including the Rockefellers, and he even had an office at 30 Rock in New York. And every once in a while, you find out that billionaires have some very unusual thoughts, like that they are direct descendants from Nebuchadnezzar, or they think about space aliens. Like, there's an ancient alien belief that you need like a centurion card to have. And... For me, the Elohim encapsulates that idea, which is kind of why I'm really interested in the idea of Yahweh to some extent predating Judaism because it puts it back into that world or that realm where it's humans operating in a reality where there are these beings which we sometimes call God that are intervening in our lives for reasons that are sometimes good, often not. And there's, a, there's an ambiguity that I think is really powerful with the Elohim, where it can carry this idea, because whilst there might not literally be space aliens in the Bible, and whilst Zechariah Sitchin might not be, he's certainly not correct about Nibiru, right? So, and that was his problem. Sorry, I'll, I'll come back to my point in a sec, but I just want to bring this out. He doubled down on the stuff that was eventually quite easily falsifiable, like the missing, the, the 12th planet in the solar system and so on. Like, he, he had, to, the whole thing had to be right. <laughs> it's not... Actually, if you read the Sumerians in a certain way, maybe they got visited by beings from off planet. That's actually a reasonable statement. The whole cosmology, like, no, 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 you have to do the whole thing. <laughs> you have to do Nibiru and the planets coming back and blah, 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 right? That was his problem. Because actually, if I think of cleverer people who've operated in this space, like Robert Temple, who wrote The Serious Mystery, he refers to this era as some kind of contact era. And contact with what? <laughs> hmm? Not sure. And all of that drama and mystery and possibility and eeriness for me is in there in Elohim. And I like, I think that's one of the strengths of Maurer's work is like, it's not just Yahweh that we translate as God. The thing that got him, at least in his videos, off on this journey is we keep using the word Lord for what appears to be collection of space aliens, right? And that was his like, why do we, why is Lord, why are we using Lord as a like modesty curtain over all these challenging words. Like, oh, just call it war. Just call it Lord. And it's, but it's not. That one, that one's this storm god. That one's a collection of space aliens whose children are banging out women. Like, there's all this stuff <laughs> going on sure. that we just bracket under Lord. And for me, I, uh, Elohim, I, magically speaking, there's a lot of juice in that ambiguity. What say you? Yeah, I think if a storm god 
told me to call him Lord. I'm not going to want to be dodging lightning bolts, you know. These guys are powerful and they move. Yeah, they move within us. There's quite a lot I want to respond to. The stories of Yahweh and the snake or Yahweh Elohim and the snake, I should say, because Yahweh is a name which comes later in the Bible when we're talking about yeah. um, the first, the second chapter of Genesis, um, where he kind of comes into the world. We're talking about Yahweh Elohim, and he's got a different name because he's a different guy from my perspective. Um, <laughs> and so Enlil and Enki from the Sumerian epics, there's a whole lot of that story that, like Enki, for example, is one of his, one of his epithets is Ushamgal, which means the great serpent. Yeah, so we've already got a serpent there in the story. We've got a warning to not eat the bread in the sure. Sumerian story, although I believe it's Enki who gives the warning, not uh, Lil. So it's kind of the other way around. We have all those elements of the story, not all of them. We have many of the elements of the story which come in to the to the Genesis story in the character of of Yahweh Elohim. Yeah, so there's there's some kind of a well, there's certainly literary tradition which they are in let's say in conversation with or which they're working with barfield has this idea that that basically we look at in, in the past we we tend to think of people as just like us but not yeah just like thinking like us but not and then we i mean we think about this in terms of what they were doing in the in the aztec civilization where you had you know what do they do once a year they got the prettiest girl they treated her nicely for a few days and then they sliced her to pieces and wore her as a you know, the priest would wear her bits as some kind of a, a cloak and walk down the street. And you're thinking, they don't think like us. <laughs> they're, excuse me. They're doing something quite different there. And, you know, this Abraham about to sacrifice his son, Isaac, you know, that's a really interesting one because this is where Yahweh appears to Abraham. He doesn't appear with his name. But it goes like this, it goes, and, and Yahweh appeared to Abraham and says to him, I am El Shaddai, take your son up the hill and sacrifice him. And Abraham, this is in a context where child sacrifice, and you see this in bits of the Bible, allude to the fact, let me put this more carefully, the Bible appears to be constructed of different documents. And in some of those documents, it appears that, like, for example, when it appears that there is child sacrifice, because when Abraham comes back down the mountain, there's no mention of Isaac, and the, the grammar suggests that he's not there. So it seems that the story was cobbled together between these different stories of different parts of what became the, of the Israelite kingdom. And yeah, that seems that there was child sacrifice in the north, but not in the south. So there's a story of, you know, he's just told to go up to sacrifice his son, gets to the top of the hill, and then the angel of Yahweh appears and says, don't sacrifice your son, it's all right, find a ram instead. Um, there are these different drives which are pushing us in different directions. And just coming away from space aliens and thinking about where the Lord might be, the things that's pushing you. You know, my compulsions come from or come from inside my head, and I, I'm overwhelmed with uh, an urge to do something. And you know, some people talk about it in the creative process uh, to write, but you know, some people just go and do really, really strange things. Moses is compelled to go down to go down to Egypt. He says, "No, I don't want to," and he goes, "Go." You know, I'll be with you, go, and, and off he goes, you know. So w what are these drives that come through us? Yeah, and I, I think one way of looking at it, which is, one way of looking at it is that the different parts of our personality or the different parts of our brain, you might even say, for example, the reptilian the reptilian brain, what you might call the reptilian brain, the pre-limbic part of the brain, which is really interested in increase, it's really interested in territory, is driving us in a certain direction. And if you look at how scorpions and snakes and stuff behave, snakes will eat their children and scorpions will eat their children. When a scorpion's born, it has to jump on its mum's back so it doesn't get eaten in some species. When you look at a, a gecko and it looks at its baby, there's no love there. It's just, you know, its eyes are kind of wiggling around like this. But there's no love there. Love for your family comes later and it comes with a limbic system. And I think there's something in the story of Yahweh that does that because Yahweh is this guy... For example, his taboo is don't boil a goat in its mother's milk. When he says to Moses, he says, here's what you've got to do. Don't drink. This is why Jews don't eat meat, milk and meat together. You know, what's he talking about that? He's talking about the sanctity of the connection between the mother and the child. Yeah. Familial love. Whereas what's the taboo with Abraham? Well, the promised Abraham is you're going to have loads of kids and you're going to have loads of descendants and you're going to cover territory. Great. That's exactly what the reptilian mind wants. 
what you're going to do for me, you're going to circumcise your child. You're going to make a mark on the symbol of procreation, the symbol of power. Then we get to Yahweh and his entirely different story. You know, he says, I'm going to give you land. This is going to be your, you can have a tribe. You're going to defeat this tribe and that tribe. He started to divide the world up differently. And why, how this relates back to the kind of Sumerian stuff. I think that as Barfield says, you know, as in different stages of our development, we perceive the world in a completely different way. And I think something happens with when you stop representing things as you know idols you know but I've, you know i've got some up here when you stop filling those with your when you remove them from the tradition and you start to work with just words you're in a kind of different place because words although they're fixed they're not as fixed as as idols right and there's something about the fluidity which emerges from uh uh getting away from the material which i think is something that happens in the transition from the Sumerian and those, the myths okay. which become yeah, so become the that, ones in the Bible. That answers a question that I was going to ask, but it just seemed weird. But I, I wanted to say two other things after that, responding, which was if, and it, it's a good, there's no reason not, if the Israelites were descended from Sumer, from Sumerians, it's like, why did they make the stories boring? And why did they go from X-Men comics to a novel? And that answers it though, right? Which is, well, the X-Men comic ac actually has to have the the pyrotechnics. It has to have the cool statues and and the, the lighting bounced off mirrors and, and whatever in <laughs> the temples. And so that, that answers it probably in a way, because I, I, I found it disappointing, but I do want to talk about the different brain thing, because I can't resist being a wag about this and say, sure, but Yahweh could have been the thing that made, because humans don't belong very well, scientifically speaking, with everything else that's going on. There's something up with us, right? So it's kind of funny. It's like, oh, yes, we can track the development of a monotheism by looking at the different parts of the brain, but also that being could have made us with those four brains. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, it's a funny loop. I don't actually believe that. I'm just saying like, I think that's a funny loop. What I do want to say is when I was with Montefero the other week in New Zealand, he was talking about the Atua, the 72 Atua, which again, God isn't the right word uh, in Maoridom and how you are with them rather than worship them. So these particular beings are flowing through you, different ones at different times. When you are, when you have a child, the obviously mother ones are flowing through you. When you're in war, ones are flowing through you. And part of the job of a tohunga or cunning man, wizard, shaman, is to identify which of the atua are most present flowing through a particular person. And what you were saying there about Yahweh being one of those things that flows through, like going with to Egypt is like, I'm going to flow through me. Right. Like, and I like, I like that. Obviously I like that better because I generally resist, um, mapping to physical parts, but we're, we're saying more or less the same thing. Right. Because the reason I like more of the Ottawa approach is it allows me my lazy, but still true <laughs> or still, um, dearly held belief that the imaginal is some kind of identical to the spirit world. So when I say the Atua are flowing through, they are coming from the spirit world. They are, they are, that is an imaginal eruption into the world. And Yahweh is that. So that's how I, f I solve the Elohim are mysterious beings. Because again, this is a good example. Atua isn't quite gods in the same way Elohim isn't quite gods. There's some kind of beings. And for me, that's how I, that's how I fold those through. Right. And I absolutely have that flow through model that I learned that from Dr. Thomas Nadler when it comes to Egypt, right? That it, it's there in the Egyptian language too. If you are angry, you are with set. Like that's what's happening. Like set is flowing through you. That's the words <laughs> for being angry in Egyptian. And that I think is correct. I think Barfield would agree. I don't know. What do you reckon? Did you, was it 72 of these things in the... 72, uh, funny old number. Isn't it? That's, that's the, the 72 names of God. In considered yeah. to be 72 names of God. Well, it's, it's um, the processional number, right? Like, this is one of those ding, ding, ding. You're, you're back down at that. Graham Hancock, just to circle it all the way back around. Atlantean level. I actually, so Matafero has two Tohunga, three actually, lineages. So I was talking to his father, who is there as well, who is one of them. And we were talking about, because I'm very familiar, it's not just the 72 and the Tohunga. There are 
gods like Ra in Maoridom, like that's the sun god. So there's actually the same names for gods in between Egypt and Maori. I mean, that's sent some people speaking of doing this wrong and being racist. There are books out there that try to make some sort of improper claim about connection there. So I actually asked this elder and he said, I think we come from the same dimension. And that's much better. <laughs> that's a much better self. Because the, the yeah. challenge is between time. Like you've got a 4,000 year difference between the old kingdom and the arrival of the Maori in New Zealand. And he said, I think we come from the same dimension. I love it. Yeah, that's really interesting. So what, what comes to mind here? Yeah, so the word gods is just problematic because we've got all this. I mean, it means so much different stuff to different people. And I mean, L is power. You might think of it as drive. In fact, Aleph, the letter Aleph is that is the source of power, and the letter Lamed, La, is it's considered the the ox goad, right? That which you use the stick that you use to direct an ox. So Aleph is is the ox, and the Lamed, the, the La, is the thing what you direct it with. So Al it also means two towards, yeah. So it cuts about that directing of power, Aleph. And, and L. So I think maybe drives or drives in a direction might be a good way of thinking about gods. But what I wanted to come back to was this idea of why does it get boring? And I'm going to illustrate from a slightly different field, which is I was talking to a guy who is, he does artificial, what do you call it? Sorry, virtual reality. He's a virtual reality researcher. He's talking about, interested in talking to me because I'm a hypnotherapist and I treat, for example, phobia. And how would I treat phobia? I take someone down into their mind and I would, in a kind of detached way, well, first I might try and find out if the phobia has a particular... So I'll give you an example. I had one client who was had a, a needle phobia. She was diagnosed as diabetic. She was about to be injected, and she would freak out and faint whenever she saw a needle. So I, she couldn't remember where it came from, but I gave her, you know, after I hypnotized her a few times, and she remembered that she'd been running around on the carpet. She stepped on a needle or a pin. She, her yeah. mum had completely freaked out which is how we get phobias normally someone freaks yeah. out she got cortisol spike and then she was phobic for the rest of her life until i took her back to that place actually put it on a kind of video screen in her mind she had a remote control in her hand she was sitting away from it and she, i made her or i invited her to run through that scene forwards and backwards forwards and backwards forwards and backwards then make it black and white then make it further away blah 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 and you make it kind of make it comfortably boring until the mind can manage it, right? And manage that scene and it, and it takes that power out of it. So the reason I, so this research was saying, wouldn't it be good if we could recreate a scene in someone that, that you know, the, the trigger with our imagery in the virtual reality space? And I'm thinking, no, not really, because that woman knows the exact texture and color of that carpet. And it's always going to be more high fidelity than your image of it is going to be. Yeah. <clears throat> when I... If you go into a trance and you go and get hypno, things can get really, really, I don't want to say CGI, because CGI suggests kind of one dimensional, because it's still one dimensional. Even in virtual reality, it's still one dimensional. Um, it's one step away from the emotional affect and from the terror and from uh, the, yeah. the sensations on your skin. And it doesn't matter how good our virtual reality suits get. And eventually, maybe we, we, we really think we'll be copulating with alien goddesses great but you can do that in your mind with so much more yeah. clarity and so much more emotion and i think you know i don't i think setting the stage for the movement of the imagination through this poetry of word by by taking the power away from those graven images yeah and i'm not coming i'm not saying don't make graven images look i've got one there right this isn't a religious prohibition that i'm suggesting here but and it's kind of an invitation into a world of word and poetry because, as you said, you know, we come from that same dimension. And if the imagination is also the spirit world, then we're going to approach it through the imagination and we're going to, our imagination is going to be more faithful to it. And obviously, imagination, image, magic, they all have the same root word, don't they? Because that's where it all begins and that's where it all comes out of, you know. So that's what yeah, I would and, say no, I'm about... All right. Okay, and it's, it's, it's almost meeting people where they're at. I like graven images. I, I like high drama, obviously. I like doing things I shouldn't do in graveyards in the middle of the night, right? That's just what it is. But I'm not normal, <laughs> right? If you're, if you're actually trying to run the spirituality of a tribe and it's like, well, we need to make this medicine available to people, 
Okay, I'm into it. All right, I like that. I have a, speaking of sort of the imagination spirit world, you're exactly the right person to ask this. So I have a metaphor that I think works for Mauro Biglino's use of literalism. And it's, and it's how you get space aliens by doing that, right? And for me, it's the difference between ayahuasca in the Amazon and DMT, right? Hebrew is ayahuasca in the Amazon. And if you try to literalize it, like you go chasing those molecule, molecules and getting that DMT hit, you get space aliens, which you don't get to the same extent when you do really at all, when you're with ayahuasca in, dare we say, her correct form. And I, so that for me, because I remember the first time I attempted to quit smoking when I was in my mid-20s, dad gave me Champix, which I don't like. If people need to quit smoking, the Alan Kerr Easy Way actually works. Or you could book with Danny and it's the same thing. It's, <laughs> right? But I started having the weirdest dreams that I knew were, as a result of this chemical I should not be having, impacting my brain. Uh, and for me, this I. It's not that the space aliens aren't there, and it's not that McKenna's machine elves aren't there. It's when you approach ayahuasca two-dimensionally. When you approach ayahuasca literally, you get space aliens. You, you get that DMT experience rather than ayahuasca experience. And I, it strikes me that, for me, that's a helpful parallel between it's not that Big Lino's wrong. Like, literally, if you, because Hebrew can do this because it's magical, if you make it perform a literal spell, it will summon space aliens. Like it'll do that for you, but it's not the only thing it can do. <laughs> and it might be more that maybe it shouldn't be used that way, which again, in his defense, he didn't say it, it should. But what do you think to that? Ayahuasca versus DMT, Hebrew versus literalism. How does that sound to you? Yeah, yeah, I like it. I like, I like the fact that you brought McKenna as well, because I can't remember the exact quote, but it's it's something along the lines of there's something really weird going on that disguises itself as aliens so as not to completely freak us out. You know? yeah, an alien invasion so as not to alarm us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I bet you just found found another one here as well, which I'll come to in a sec. But yeah, so ayahuasca, because it comes on slowly and because ayahuasca is really and this is again going back to the McKenna brothers, it's not just harmaline and DMT. It's not just beta carbolines. Yeah unlocking dmt there is just looking at it in terms of pharmacology there's all sorts going on in ayahuasca there's all sorts going on in chakruna or the other um the other plants that you may be exposed to and there's a reason that ayahuasca made with one leaf has a different quality to ayahuasca made with another leaf it's because it's more than beta carbolines and dmt it's all and then when and not even beginning to start with the spiritual aspect of it um, but if we did go down there I've been in a situation where I've, I remember actually when I lived in Brazil, I went to the house where the ayahuasca was being made and I said, I was going to say, what's wrong with this ayahuasca? It's making me go to sleep. I'm not used to that. That's not what it's meant to do. And when I got there, I realized they'd got a new machine and they were making it with a machine rather than oh, nice. they were making another yeah. process. I didn't know that, but they were like, hey, look at our new machine. So there is something about the actual intention and process uh, and meditation that goes into the construction of it as well. But just leaving all that beside, there's all sorts of other things going into that, which is not DMT, you know. So DMT hits us in a very specific way and very hard and very quick. And suddenly it's like, what is the closest thing to my what's inside my head? that I can use to interpret his experience. And it's like, well, I've seen UFO, I've seen, I've seen Star Wars, maybe it's some, or seen Star Trek, you know, and that, because you're, you, you know, it, it, it's, it's coming back to this idea of the word and the image as well. Like suddenly there's all of this potential and it could go in any different direction, you know, and we go alien. Yeah. And so DMT can often do that. The personalities that come through with DMT or indeed even more friendly with ayahuasca they have more time to explain themselves you're if right. you're drinking ayahuasca yeah. and as you, you know you mentioned it in the jungle as well you've actually gone there you've spent time i mean one goes there one spends time there you're already in communication with all of the birds and the insects which are keeping you up at night with their noises you know i remember being the amazon and realizing that there's a particular creature that goes 
And it's very, you know, playing the Maracay, in my lineage, Daimi, you played the Maracay, you played the, uh, the, the Shaker in a particular way. It's like you either play in three, you play in four. So it goes, yep. or it goes, last time, one, one session, one session last trip, I thought the woman mm. next to me in the Maloka was listening to marching music. Because she would, which I found quite antisocial, but it's her life, I guess. But she would come in and put headphones on <laughs> and cover up with a blanket and wouldn't participate at all till the end of the ceremony. And I just, because I could hear that being, I'm like, what the fuck? Is, what is she listening to so loud through her headphones? And I, like, what kind of Russian marching music is she listening to that I could hear? And it was this well, like, this rhythm. Then I'm like, wait a minute. Right. That's not her. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a bit weird. I know the beat. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I really hope she wasn't the Dime Mister who'd taken Dime music along to the thing. I wouldn't be surprised. These things do happen. But yeah, so so I could hear the, the sound of the maraca in the sound of this of this creature. And again, it was interesting because it was just a it was a constant percussive sound but i was breaking up into three i was breaking up into four because that's what i was familiar with you know but but my, my point is that if you go to the amazon or even if you prepare you don't have to go to the amazon you know if you do your dieta right in wherever you happen to be and you spend time in nature and when i say dieta i mean you don't have to be celibate for a month and do all that kind of stuff but if you do approach it with a mental dieta we like think about certain things spend time in nature trying not to get into a fight, trying not to watch zombie films, et cetera, et cetera, and then you go into your ayahuasca experience, then you're already kind of opening the door to communication. And then they can talk slowly and they can talk gradually. I think that I like to compare ayahuasca and DMT to the difference between a roller coaster and a bicycle. Because on mm. a roller coaster, you start somewhere, you do all kinds of crazy stuff, and then you end up where you started again. And on a bicycle, you cycle off somewhere and then you end up somewhere else. And I wonder if... You know, my reading of the po the Bible and the poetry of the Bible is it's 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 iterative and it's 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 I mean I'm in conversation with it. Like just a really simple exactly. example, you know, yeah. that, that line I mentioned before, there's a line which goes and he will become you know, they'll 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 eat the they'll eat the fruit and they'll become like us, knowing good and evil. Yeah, and the Elohim are talking. He will, you know, their eyes will open. They'll become like us, knowing good and evil. If you look into the Hebrew, it's not clear whether that is they'll become like us, knowing evil, good and evil, like we do, or they'll become like us. But unlike us, they'll also know good and evil. Yeah. yeah? And then from there, okay, that's an invitation for me to then go and investigate. Right. So, do the Elohim know good and evil? Well, do they lie? Yes, they do. Does the snake lie? No, he doesn't. Right. So now we're doing is a lie evil. And when they behave, do they behave? Their, do they follow their own commandments? You know, it's, thou that, shalt not this kill. Ayahuasca, right. Like because that's that's yeah. the actual psychedelic experience of 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 being in the the expansiveness of reality as opposed to the literal version where you just hold on and oh, look, space aliens. And now I'm back. And and, and I, yeah, it's it's I, where this idea came from for me was just. A disappointing night in Ecuador. Like I, I still like the the pyrotechnics. When I do ayahuasca, I still like visuals. And this wasn't a particularly visual ceremony, and so I was almost sulking, like just sitting up in the maloca. I know it's a red road or red path ceremony, so there's like fire in the middle, unlike the Shipibo ones. The smoke sort of lingering and a few candles. And whilst I wasn't tripping, like I generally prefer. I did have this, suddenly understood the true meaning of psychedelia or psychedelic. Like I was in this powerfully expanded mental state where I could process and outgas stuff that I, trauma stuff that I needed to by, by having access to it. And I think Hebrew can do that. That's what you were saying. Like you can engage with the text because it's bigger on the inside than it looks on the outside. And, and it's this, this powerful, powerful medicine. And then if you try to literalize it to two-dimensionalize it, you get space aliens like smeared and that's yeah anyway i'm i'm into it uh, that's that's uh, <laughs> i'm going to i'm going to run this idea into the fucking ground i swear <laughs> yeah yeah um i i guess one of the one of the things that comes to mind is is how how much can we imagine you know and i'm thinking about like if i watch a film like casablanca after and i watched indiana jones the other day and some months ago, I watched Casablanca. And there's loads more going on in terms of crazy stuff. 
with Indiana Jones, but the meditation on Casablanca oh, was, uh, yeah. you know, gave me a lot more. And I wonder, you know, like engage with your aliens. It's brilliant. Do it. Like engage with the text, however you, however you like, but at the same or at the end of a, a reading of the Bible and at the end of a psychedelic experience, the real proof is in what kind of a person are you, right? How kind are you now as opposed to how kind are you before? How much attention are you paying now as opposed to how much attention you were paying before? And I think that's kind of the proof. The, the proof of the pudding, you know, I, I know I know a guy who's who's really into space aliens and he's an absolutely lovely human being, one of the kindest and sweetest people I know. And fantastic. If contact with aliens can do that for you, then then just wicked. My my approach to the text is is more poetic and my approach to psychedelics is perhaps a little bit less on the visual side. And I think that's that's actually, you know, in the jungle you don't see very far anyway. You see as far as the next tree. In the in the jungle, the feelings and the kind of words that we don't have language to describe in a post enlightenment era, you know, sensing what your sensing where your enemy is in the forest or sensing yeah. what the other person is thinking or, you know, sensing where your prey is, all that kind of stuff, which is much more much much more woo woo in our stupid language how we describe that stuff now we've even got a word for it which is woo woo like yeah it works for me and my nervous system and my stories to engage the text and engage the world and engage psychedelics in in that particular way i like it it's a good good place to wind up uh, however you encounter the text make sure you're less of a dick uh, than, <laughs> than when you first found it or however so, you count uh, your aliens, you know, if, if you get if you get if you get spirited away, if you get ruched away by aliens and they probe around and do experiments on you and you come back and you're just a super cool guy. Oh, yeah. Go hang out with aliens. Well, I'm down with it. <laughs> well, sir, I knew this was going to be a fun chat and, and I'm glad we we got deep into the book and it was very satisfying because I get, keep getting asked about it. And I, I, yours was the opinion I wanted the most on uh, on this particular book in this particular thesis. So thank you very much. And uh, what do you got going on? Yeah, well, how can people find you? What's coming up? Tell us things. I've got a new website coming out very shortly. It's not out today, but it might be out by the time this comes out. It's called dannynemu.com. And that's going to have, it's going to have my books, which are Neuro Apocalypse, which is not about the stuff we're talking about today. It's Science Revealed, which is much more about the history of science, the place of revelation in that. There in there, I'm doing a lot more hypnosis these days. I'm doing um, live group hypnosis down here in Hastings, where I live. And I'm going to be starting to do sessions with the Psychedelic Society as well. We're going to be doing some online hypnosis, transformational hypnosis stuff. So it's you know, I am a hypnotherapy, but it's not, I am a hypnotherapist. That's an interesting word to break up differently because if you break it up differently, it becomes hypno the rapist. So be careful where you break up the word and be careful <laughs> where you break up the world. But yeah, so I'm, so we're doing kind of transformational hypnosis. So that's going to be on there as well. What else have I got going on? And, you know, for those people who are interested in engaging with the, I, I run, I founded and I run a decolonial ecosystem restoration and regeneration and re and reforestation network working with indigenous groups and black women's groups in the slums of brazil and all that kind of jazz in a way which is not so much inspired by the 19th century gentleman but by mutual aid and how nature's networks how mycelia how slime molds communicate and i'm all about collective intelligence and what happens when we get together as a group so in terms of the group hypnosis, that's part of it. But also in terms of, I guess, my day job is planting trees with uh, marginalized groups and finding ways to connect up, for example, businesses in the UK with um, reforestation projects in Brazil. So we can all work together and collectivize our love, our power and our intelligence. And the website for that is uh, Rain Reforest, www.rainreforest.org. So check that out as well, please. Wonderful. And of course, that is all in the show notes. But thank you once again. And yeah, great chat, everyone. And also we'll point to the book and some of the Big Lino videos in the show notes as well. But uh, good times. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Gordon. Watch out for the aliens. <laughs>